from Moab to the fields of Bethlehem. We're going to follow Ruth, who walked with Naomi, who worked in the field of Boaz, and see her character as she interacts with different people, as she's taken from Moab from her family, how she could possibly have interacted there in a country, in a nation full of idolatry and immorality. And so we marvel and we wonder at this woman, this wonderful character, how she did come from Moab to the fields of Bethlehem. So on the slide, looking at the silhouette I have of maybe a form of a woman and what I would like to portray to you, Ruth, the silhouette of Ruth. And as we go through the evening, may we put some colour and some form into the silhouette of character. So we're going to look at this, uh, the character of this amazing woman, Ruth. And also, I want us to focus on our class tonight of a powerful excitation of helping us to understand a little better those who come to the gospel hope and, work, um, and the work of Christ in the ecclesia. So those that come out of the world and are called to the gospel hope and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ in the ecclesia. Because I believe strongly from the study of Ruth that she is indeed the ecclesia and how it should be working the, in actions and in character in spreading the gospel and tending to those in need and poor in the ecclesia. Our brother Dan uh, did um, a class two weeks ago on Abigail and considered her character and her virtue and her interaction with her husband and also interaction with David. And to introduce that class, he went to Proverbs 31. And so I'd like us to go there, turn to Proverbs 31 briefly, to springboard into our subject of Ruth tonight, because as I did look through that with our brother Dan, there's some things that jumped out at me that I feel strongly uh, that are represented in the book of Ruth. So firstly, in verses 1 to 9, in verse 1, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. So these are words to a son, words to a man, words to a king. So it's advice to a man to understand and speak righteously. And there's two warnings in there. A warning against women in verse 3, give not thy strength unto women, and also a warning in verses 4 to 7 about strong drink, being drunk, being intoxicated. So we have an emotional conviction with the things that the woman brings, being overpowered by that which influenced Solomon, which brought him down, and we see that in 1 Kings 11, 1 to 4, where it gives an impressive list of women from other countries that slowly and emotionally drag Solomon into their beliefs and idolatry and religion. And finally, the warning against strong drink, the dulling of the truth of the mind. Turn with me quickly to Matthew 24, the Olivet Prophecy. And the Lord Jesus Christ gives this warning in verse 44 of Matthew 24. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. And I like to change those words, think not, to when you're not thinking. When your mind is dull, that's when the Lord Jesus Christ will come. When we're not working in the ecclesia, when we're not doing the things of Ruth and being kind and being separate from the world and where we've come from, from, I, from Moab and idolatry. So be ready, because when you're not thinking, that's when the Lord Jesus Christ will come. Be vigilant and think upon the kingdom to come. So that's the warning against strong drink that slowly inebriates our brains to go to sleep and be dull from the principles of God. In verse 9, the mother tells the son, Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. And this is what I'd like to suggest to you, brethren and sisters, is the, 
is the job or the work of Boaz. He was one who was wise and he was one who spoke righteousness and pleaded the cause of the poor and needy. He was the one that instructed his workers to leave more than what was required in the corners uh, of the field so that the poor could glean, and especially Ruth. So he did speak words of righteousness so that others may benefit. And I want to contrast that to Ruth because in verses 10 to 31, we have advice to a woman with actions to attend to her family and help the poor and needy. So this virtuous woman tends to her family and also gives aid to the poor and needy. In verse 20, if we read that together, she stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hand to the needy. So there she is. She's the extension of the king who speaks righteousness. Here she is doing righteousness. She's giving to the poor and needy. That's Ruth. Even though she was in that circumstance herself, she sees past that and does the work to help others. In the field where Jew and Gentile come together to reap. She opened her mouth in verse 26. With wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She's kind. That is her law. And wisdom. That is applied understanding and applied knowledge. She knew the words of Boaz, the Lord Jesus Christ. She was the ecclesia. And that is our exhortation, brethren and sisters, is that we are moved by Ruth to work in the field, the ecclesia, to do works of kindness, to preach the word, to gather in the grain and to distribute it evenly and righteously amongst all. So what we have here in Proverbs 31, brethren and sisters, is a combination of man and wife who show the workings of Christ, speaks righteously, the ecclesia, the outworkings of the words of her Lord to help and bring others to one hope. And in Ephesians 5, verses 25 to 27, we have the man who, has, who is as a husband to love the woman and give himself for, it, for her, even as Christ gave himself for the ecclesia. And so we have that relationship, brethren and sisters, of Boaz and Ruth with Christ and the ecclesia, who washed us with the words so that we could then go forth and do actions of goodness and kindness to declare our faith. So moving along, I want us to look at the timing of Ruth. I, I looked at um, Brother H.P. Mansfield's um, section on Ruth in the story of the Bible, and he indicates that we're not told. We know it's in Judges sometime. So I sort of did a little bit of a, um, uh, a map, a timeline there, to sh show where I think and where I, where I want to suggest to you, brethren and sisters, um, Ruth falls. And so I've just uh, got my little red dot there. And here I have Ruth 1 to 4. In the times of Ehud the judge and the, the, um, the ruling over Israel by the Moabites for uh, 18 years. So we've had Othniel, who was the first judge, which was Caleb's brother, younger brother. And then we had Ehud. So if you look down the bottom line, we have Salmon, who married Rahab at the beginning of the uh, conquest of the land under Joshua, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, and then finally to David. So in that, Ju uh, that Judah um, line there, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five uh, people from Salmon to David. Whereas in the Levitical line, we have quite a few more um, showing the average uh, lifespan there of 23 years opposed to 97. So putting that chronologically, we place Ruth approximately at the beginning of the judges um, under the judge rule of Ehud. But prior to that, they were under the rulership of the Moabites because Israel kept declining and turning to the idolatry of the nations round about. <coughs> now, I've got there a, a picture of a very fat man, a very fat man, Eglon. 
in Judges 3.17. And that is the exact quote of this man. He was very fat. And he was the king of, Moabite, uh, of the Moabites at that time, the time of Ehud, in which I'm suggesting that Ruth, the Moabite test, um, existed in the book of Ruth, was written. So in Judges 3, verses 12 to 14, if we turn there, I just want to make the, it stand out of what the nation of Israel was really like um, at this time. Because this is what Ruth was coming to out of Moab. Judges 3. So 12 to 14. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of Yahweh, and Yahweh strengthened Eglon, our very fat king, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of Yahweh. And he gathered unto the children of, uh, gathered the children of Ammon and Amalek, and went and smote Israel, and possessed the city of palm trees. Verse 14, so the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, for 18 years. And there was the oppression of the Moabites over Israel at this time, because they had sinned. And it's interesting to, to, to look back to verse 7, because it says there, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of Yahweh. Why? Because they forgot Yahweh their God and served Balaam and the groves. And brethren, sisters, may that be the case with Elimelech. May it be that he forgot Yahweh in the goodness when there was a time of famine, which caused him to take his family into Moab. Because Moab was ruling over Israel. Moab was a place of opportunity. Moab, as it would appear, was a place where he thought he could bring his family up while Israel was in sin and under the oppression of the Moabites. So Yahweh strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, and Israel were under bondage for 13, 18 years. An Ammonite or a Moabite? In Deuteronomy 23.3, we see this written of the Ammonites and the Moabite. They shall not enter into the congregation of Yahweh. Even to the 10th generation shall they not enter into the congregation of Yahweh forever. So then, brethren and sisters, why, why Ruth? Why did God allow Elimelech to take his family into Moab? Why did God let these things happen? Why couldn't they have just stayed there? And Marlon and Chilion found nice Israelitish girls. We don't know those answers to these things sometimes, brethren and sisters. We don't know why trials come upon us, but it did. And what happened was the blossom of this beautiful woman who came into the hope of Israel. And we see in 2 Peter 3 and 9 that Yahweh says he is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, toward us ward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Ruth, and what God saw in this woman, Ruth, would see a, a, a woman who would repent, who would hunger and thirst for righteousness and seek the things of the God of Israel. And so those that clung to the idolatry of Moab or the Ammonites would never find eternal life. But we find that Ruth came to repentance and that's what one of the beautiful characteristics is that she was meek and teachable. This is what it says about the daughters of Moab. Digging down a little bit deeper because this is where Israel was um, attacked morally, uh, if you can remember back to Balaam and Balak, and when they were cursing Israel before they came into the land. They were a threat to Moab. So here in Numbers 25, and 1 to 2 we read, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. This was before before they entered into the land, the times of Moses and Joshua. So it wasn't far removed to what I'm suggesting was the time of Ruth 
near the beginning of the Judges. The daughters of Moab were steeped in immorality and deeply affected by their gods to cause Israel, the mighty nation of God, to bow down to their gods. Emotional conviction doesn't lead us in the right direction. The love of women will drag us down. We need to be separate from the world. The Moabite, Moabitish god Chemosh. So there was a, a stone excavated, um, Dibon, and I'll read this for us. Information of, the Chemish, of Chemish, their god, is scarce, although archaeology and texts can render a clearer picture of the deity. So in 1868, an archaeolo archaeological find at Dibon provided scholars with more clues to the nature of Chemosh. The find, known as the Moabite stone or the mesh steel, was a, or steely or however you say that, was a monument bearing an inscription commemorating the 1860 BC endeavours of King Mesha to overthrow the Israelites' dominion of Moab. And uh, we find that in 2 Samuel 8, 2. So this shows um, in hard archaeological evidence that they did worship the god Chemosh. Not much known about this god. But we do know in 2 Kings verses 3 to 27 that he required this god uh, blood sacrifice, and in particular of the firstborn son. So the king of Moab offered his son, um, which would have been a grisly and a gruesome um, show of how convicted he was to this false god, a god requiring blood. So this is what Ruth was coming out of, brethren and sisters. Ruth's parents... We don't know much about them, but let's sort of go through the story of Ruth and see if we can find little bits, pearls of wisdom, little bits that we can sort of piece things together. Ruth 1.8. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house. Yahweh deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with have dealt with the dead and with me. And so I want to emphasize here, or I want to point out that Naomi only refers to return to your mother's house. Um, and I, I suggest to you, brethren and sisters, that maybe the father was dead. Ruth's father was dead. I may have got that wrong, but I'm suggesting that the father was dead because Naomi only refers return to your mother's house. And it's referred to two times in Scripture. One in Genesis 24 to 28, where Rebecca runs to tell her mother, uh, her mother's house, when um, Abraham's servant comes seeking uh, a son for Isaac. And so then Laban comes out and speaks on behalf of the household, suggesting that there is no father of Rebecca's, Rebecca or her family because he's dead therefore the mother's house, and Laban now is the spokesman for the family. And the other reference is in Song of Solomon about the bride's dream and longing for her beloved and incorporating that into her mother's house uh, along with that. But it seems to suggest from that first reference in Genesis 24-28 that Ruth perhaps didn't have a father at this time. Why? Well... Back in Judges 3.29, where we were just before, talking about Eglon. Once Eglon was killed by Ehud, he stirred up Israel then to break off the shackles of the Moabites and the idolatry. And it says there in verse 29, And they slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty, and all men of valour, and there escaped not a man. So 10,000 lusty, uh, 10, lusty men were destroyed, killed, wiped out by the Israelites under the leadership of Ehud. Strong's exhaustive concordance says there about that word lusty, fat, lusty, plenteous, greasy, gross, figuratively rich, fat, lusty, plenteous. So not only a status or physicality, but I suggest to you people that were indulgent. So they may have seen a gross size as a symbol and status of power in their community. 
And perhaps Ruth's father was one of them. Perhaps Elimelech had allowed his, well, after Elimelech died, perhaps the uh, Marlon and Chilion had married into these families of these notable men, men of valour, but also men of indulgence. So perhaps Ruth's father was dead, killed in the battle led by Ehud, the judge. Ruth's first husband, Marlon. So in Ruth 4, verse 10, we're introduced to who uh, married Marlon, and it was, it was Ruth. We're not told, we're just told that he was, she married one of the boys of Naomi. <coughs> and it says there, moreover, Ruth a Moabites, the wife of Marlon. So I want, to, I want to impress upon you, brethren and sisters, that she probably loved this man. Well, she did love this man. She was grieved and she sorrowed. Ten years they were married. And so Ruth was being shaped, not only to marry into a family from Israel, but to go through grief and sorrow. Her character, brethren and sisters, was being shaped. So I've got there on the next slide, the mental and moral qualities distinctive in an individual. That's character. Moral qualities distinctive to an individual. Mental and moral. And so I try to apply that to what character was in the Bible when I couldn't find the word character. But I came up with conscience. And the word there out of Strong's is prolonged form of G, the Greek there, 4894. Co-perception. So two things there. You've got the conscience and the personality working together well, that is moral consciousness conscience so a personality and a conscience working together to cause actions towards others and that was Ruth she was a woman that was developing a moral awareness to direct one's actions she was sorrowing she was going through turmoil she lost her husband and now her mother-in-law was wanting to return back to Bethlehem because she had heard that the famine was over and it was now a land of plenty. She's confused. She's conflicted. Just like we all are in our journey to the fields of Bethlehem to serve God. And so she comes to a point in her life where she has to make a decision. A moral awareness to direct one's actions. Empathy. I believe these things are happening to Ruth to give her the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. And especially Naomi, because she's going to need her on that quiet, long walk back to Bethlehem as she has time to reflect. And so there would be Ruth going with her to give her that support. And so too, brethren and sisters, is the excitation for us that we walk with each other quietly, that we be there to bear burdens and that we empathise like our dear sister Ruth. In Ruth 4... Verse 5, 15, we see a great love that is noted by the women in the gate, or the women of his, in Bethlehem. Verse 15, 14, sorry. And the women said unto, said unto Naomi, Blessed be Yahweh, which have not left thee this day without a kinsman, that's his name may be famous in Israel, and he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. So it's noted there that the women said that Ruth loved Naomi. So that's not a light-hearted thing, and that's something that's seen by others. So let's take note of that in her character, a genuine love to walk beside this woman in her time of need. Ruth 1, 16 to 17, which her brother Nana read with us. I will go, I will live, my people, my God, I will die where you die, I will be buried with you. There is this, in, there is this uh, unity, there is this synchronised um, desire of, of will, and of direction with Naomi from Ruth. She wants to associate her th 
herself to where she's going, to where Naomi's going, to where she's going to live. She wants her people to be uh, Naomi's people to be her people, and her God to be my Ruth's God. I will die where you die. I will be buried with you. But is that where it ends, brethren and sisters? What's the next step there? Because we end in, I will be buried with you. And we think, well, it's got to be life. It's got to be resurrection. So if we turn to 1 verse 19, so they too went until they came to Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the house of bread. So the place where life would be given. And think thousands of years later, in John 6, verse 48 to 51, as we read that together, the Lord Jesus Christ says this, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eats of the bread, of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So here we have it, brethren and sisters, our sister Ruth, our sister Naomi, work, walking together. Ruth is transitioning from Moab, from idolatry. She's showing separateness from from the things of the world, from the things that even Israel was steeped in at times and going through the judges. They went through that cycle where they would sin and they would suffer and then they would cry to God and then God would deliver them. Here's Ruth walking together with Naomi back to Israel. Verse 2, 17 to 18, we see Ruth's care for Naomi. Verse 17, Ruth then is busy, busy in the field of Boaz, busy doing the things that are going to benefit others. So we read that together, verses 17 to 18. So she gleaned in the field unto even, and beat out that which she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw it, that, but, that what she had gleaned. And she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she uh, was sufficed. So we've jumped a section there because I, I want to reserve that for her interaction with Boaz. But here we have her interaction and her care for her uh, mother-in-law Naomi. And think back to Proverbs Proverbs 31, the virtuous woman, how she cared for the poor and the needy, how she extended her arm and her, the law was, her law was kindness. She gleaned hard, laborious work. She was there from early to even. Then she didn't go home. She beat out the barley. She got an, about an ether of barley, which is approximately 22 litres, which is quite a lot of uh, barley grain to beat out and to gather and put into can containers. Then she went into the city. We don't know what she did when she got into the city. We know she went to, to Naomi. But I want to suggest to you that she went and sold. She got money. Because the food that Naomi, uh, that Naomi receives from Ruth is the provision that was given to her by Boaz. So she had enough when she was at Boaz's table, when she was in the field, when she was invited in. But then she took some home, wrapped it up, took it home and gave it to Naomi so that she, uh, she could eat as well. So this virtuous lady, this virtuous woman, uh, Ruth, is busy. And looking at that list of things that she did in those two verses tires me out. And that's what we need to be doing in the Ecclesia, brethren and sisters. Gleaning, unto evening, working long, Beat out the barley and, and look at the quantity. Go into the city and sell so that others can benefit and then feed. Not a physical demand on us, brethren and sisters, but a spiritual one. We need to be careful that we don't burn out physically, but mentally we need to be providing for each other and for those that will come into the, the field of God. The field. 
and that was on our title page. Ruth's desire to go to the field absolutely astonished me. When I read that, I just marvelled how she came to the conclusion herself, not under the instruction of Naomi, but desired to go to this field. She instigates the action. Such is her spiritual development coming from Moab, walking with Naomi to Bethlehem, the house of bread, and now in her spiritual development, she says, I want to go to this field. Why? She wants to find grace, brethren and sisters. She wants to find God, God's character, and she wants to apply it to herself. She knows her scriptures. In Leviticus 9, 19, verses 9 to 10, and 23 to 22, we have the law instructing the children of Israel to leave provision in the fields for the poor and the needy. Let's turn there and look at that. In 19 verses 9 to 10. God in his mercy wanted the children of Israel to see this in the law. The spirit of the law to provide for others. To provide for those who didn't uh, have such good circumstances. So that we may think outside our own selfish lives and develop into the children of God. So in Leviticus 19 verses 9 to 10. And when you reap, reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of the field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of the har the har thy harvest. And thou shalt not glean the vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of the vineyard. And thou shalt leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am Yahweh, your God. Just turn your eyes back to the beginning of that chapter, brethren and sisters. Speak unto the congregation, in verse 2, of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I am holy. For Yahweh, I am Yahweh, your God, am holy. He wanted them to be impressed by the law, to become separate from the fleshly thinking to be like him. Ruth desired to go to that field to find grace. Not that she saw herself in the poor and the needy category, but she was providing for others. So in doing those acts... Her motivation was others. And so we see and we deeply appreciate the character of this woman. Separation, verse 1. Verse 2, fear mother and father. Verse 3, turn not unto idols. I'm just trying to think where I got that from. Leviticus 9, verse 1 to 3. So there, verse 1 separate yourself as it should be verse 2 every man fear uh, that you shall fear every man his mother should be verse 2 uh, verse 2 should be verse 3 sorry and 4 turn not unto idols this is Ruth she didn't turn to idols she left them she left Moab she feared her new mother her mother-in-law she reverenced her and her new father the God of Israel and she separated herself. In a time where the judges, where the children of Israel struggled to separate, where they had no respect for their parents, and where they turned to idolatry, Ruth shone like a beacon. The field, Deuteronomy 24. These are the last words of Moses. And he adds to this um, in 24 and, 20, and 19. And it says there, It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. Think of that. Stranger. Ruth, she was a stranger. She says to Boaz, I am just a stranger. Why do you consider me to show me grace? She was fatherless. I suggested at the beginning that her father perhaps was one of the lusty men, the 10,000 men of Eglon. She was a widow. She was full of sorrow. She had grieved. She was fatherless and she was a stranger. And this is the provision under the law, brethren and sisters, that God made to call people out so that they would find a place in the ecclesia of God. Let's not ruin that. Let's not bar people from our ecclesia from finding the gospel truth. 
In verse 19, it was the grain harvest mentioned. In verse 20, we read it was the oil harvest. And in verse 21, the grape harvest. Grain, bread, oil, the word of God, and the grape, the wine. All those things that they could glean. Fellowship around the bread and the wine and the word of God. That's what was provided under the law. That was the spirit. In verse 22, thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman out of Egypt. We were all out of sin. We all had the same measure of grace, brethren and sisters. And so Ruth would have found that same measure of grace when she went to the field of Boaz. And that's what she declares back in Ruth 2, verse 3. In whose sight I shall find grace. And I'm suggesting there she did go and want to talk to the head reaper. But spiritually, she wanted to find grace under the, the, the law and under God and the spirit of the law. Ruth's interaction with Boaz. And Ruth, back in Ruth 2, verse 5. Boaz comes to the field. He comes from Bethlehem and he comes on and there's some salutations. It's quite a cheerful time. And that sets a picture of what Ruth would have come to. It was harvest time, Passover. There was this hubble, a hustle and hubble of uh, excitement as people were preparing for feast time, for acknowledging the goodness of God and his sacrifice. And this is what R Ruth would have walked into in this field and as she came into Bethlehem with Naomi. It would have amazed her, coming out of the idolatry and Moab to this place where there appeared to be this excitement around the things of God. And Boaz notices that, that there's somebody new in the field and says unto his servant that was set over the reapers, whose damsels, damsel was this? So the word damsel there is girl, maiden, young woman. Um, turn over to Ruth 3 verse 10. And he said, Blessed be thou of Yahweh, my daughter. For thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. So Boaz's perception of Ruth in the physicality of things was that she was young in comparison to him. She was just a maid, a girl, a young woman. But yet there she was with her head amongst the things of God, in the field showing actions for the poor and the needy, just like the virtuous woman that we find in Proverbs 31. Ruth 2, verses 8 to 9. And then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest not thou, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, and abide, but abide here and fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. So Boaz, brethren, sisters, the type, the, the type of Christ here makes provision for Ruth, who is the ecclesia. Glean in no other field. Stay here. This is thine ecclesia. Stay by my maidens. Stay by them. And they can in some small way, teach you the things of God. They can be happy with you at this time of Passover and harvest. I've commanded the young men not to touch thee, not to harass thee, for some in Israel have still not been um, touched by the word of God and they may uh, take the opportunity to abuse you. So I've given them instruction. And drink that which the young men have drawn. So drink deeply of the word of God here in my field. Ruth 3.10, Ruth acknowledges her position uh, in, in verse 10. Then she fell on her face. And if you can remember back to Brother Dan's um, class on Abigail, she fell down at the feet of David. So it seems here in her personal development, she recognizes her position to this man who is, who is um, her savior. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me seeing I am a stranger. 
Isn't that repentance? She's acknowledged her position. I'm a sinner, brethren and sisters. How can I find grace? You don't find it. It's given. And due to the works of this beautiful, beautiful character of this woman, she's rewarded with the grace that was given to her in the field of Boaz, where Jew and Gentile come together to work for the things of God. Verse 11. This is Boaz's response. And said unto her, It has fully been showed me. So he hasn't observed it. It's been told him by others. All that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the, the death of thine husband, and how that thou hast left thy father and thy mother, so there Boaz adds father, and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto the people which thou knewest not henceforth. A hitherto, here too. So he notes about Ruth, this Christ-like man, caring for Naomi. He notes that her husband is dead, that she would have sorrowed and mourned, and it would have been a terrible transition for her to come, come from Moab into Israel. She left her natural family, and she's come to a people she knew not. Boaz speaks righteously. He speaks like the words of advice to the man, the king, in Proverbs 31. And he commends our dear sister Ruth for these things. And we can see her character shining here, brethren and sisters. Her moral compass pointing to the things of God. Ruth 3 verse 11. Yahweh recompense thy work, and a full reward be given unto thee. Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. That's verse 12, sorry, not verse 11. So Boaz goes on to say, that you are now trusting in God and God is covering you with his wings. There in Ezekiel 16 verse 8, we have this analogy of God and Israel, how God finds this girl who is naked and he spreads his skirt over her. And that word skirt is the same as wing there back in Ruth. So Boaz is saying that God is going to spread his wing and his skirt over you and take care of you. And cover your nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, saith Adonai Yahweh, and thou becamest mine. So here we have this beautiful reflection to God and to Israel with Boaz and, and Ruth, where he's saying, Whose wings thou art come to trust, whose skirt will be spread over you, and you're going to enter into a covenant, a relationship where you will be saved and be God's. That takes us to the interaction with Boaz and the threshing floor. A little bit of an awkward event because the woman should not have been there. But with careful consideration with Naomi and sharing what had happened the previous day, they plan what is to be done. And there Ruth says, spread your skirt over me. In uh, Ruth 12 verse 2, uh, verse 3, sorry, uh, chapter 3. The word skirt, as we've said, is the word for Hebrew word for, for wing. This word is used only one other place in Ruth, namely in Ruth 12.2, which was uh, what we said uh, previously, whose wings thou art come to trust. So wings and skirt is the same word. The Lord recompense you for what you have done, and a full reward will be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings that thou art take, come to take refuge. She is taking refuge under Boaz. This young girl coming to this older man who sees a Christ-like figure. Brethren and sisters, we are Ruth, the ecclesia. Do we seek to be covered by the skirt, the wings of our Saviour? Are we entered deeply into that covenant relationship? Well, we've been baptised, but does it really mean something to us to, to cause us to go into action to serve others, the poor and the needy? Boaz was God's agent to reward Ruth. He gave her three access to the field and protection from the young men and water from the well. Ruth had said to Boaz in Ruth, verse, uh, Ruth 2 verse 10, Why have I found favour in your eyes? Boaz answered in verse 12, Because you have come to take refuge under the wings of God. That was her motivation. She was seeking God. 
All those other things were good, those characteristics which helped others. But she had God in her eyes, and Boaz saw that and commended her for it. Take refuge, find grace. It was all about the field of God. As we come to the end of our study, our character study of this uh, wonderful woman, I want us to turn to Titus. Because on my travels and doing this study through the scriptures, I, I came across this, which is very similar to a, a good description of John the Baptist and how he was separate from the things of the world. But here I applied it to Ruth. So in Titus 2 verses 11 to 13, we'll traverse that and compare it to Ruth. In verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation have appeared to all men. Finding grace and redemption in the field of Boaz where Jew and Gentile can dwell together. The salvation that appeared to all men. Jew and Gentile together in the field of Boaz reaping the word of God, the grain. Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Ruth was impressed by the law of Moses to come out, to see the Spirit of God, and she did. She denied the gluttonous, the idolatry nation of Moab. She clung to the teachings of Naomi and walked with her to the house of bread, Bethlehem. She showed separation. So it teaches us, brethren and sisters, to say no to ungodliness. In a time that is, it is so important to do that, when we can crawl back into the things of the world and the comfort of our own homes, say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. Be motivated by our dear sister Ruth and her beautiful character. From Moab to the fields near Bethlehem. Verse 13, looking for that blessed, blessed hope and that gloriously appearing of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And Ruth 4, 14 to 13 and 15 in comparison. And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel, and he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age, for thy daughter-in-law which loveth thee which is better than, than seven sons, have borne him. And so looking for that blessed hope, which Naomi had once been so downcast and bitter, has now got hope in an heir to carry on the inheritance of Elimelech through Ruth. So looking to the appearing of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, the hope that Ruth gave Naomi, and the hope that our Lord Jesus Christ gives, us, gives to us. I just want to have a quick comparison of Ruth to the, the times of the judges. While judges is about breaking covenant, Ruth here is about keeping covenant, especially when she wanted to be covered by the skirts of Boaz. While judges emphasizes canonization and curse, Ruth emphasizes sanctification and blessing. She wants to be cleansed. She wants to be made righteous and blessed, while the people of Israel wanted to be like Canaan and the idolatry that was happening there. While Judges documents acts of self-interest, Ruth documents acts of self-sacrifice. While Judges finally depicts the lack of kingship, Ruth finally depicts the line of the kingship. So in those days there was no king and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's where we leave Judges. But Ruth provided the line, the inheritance to David, the greatest king of Israel, a man whose heart was like God's. So, brethren and sisters, as we finally wrap, out our wrap up our study together, Ruth 3.11. And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman, or as the ESV says, a worthy woman. So we set out at the beginning of our study of Ruth to look at the character of this amazing person, Ruth. And brethren and sisters, I hope you have a deeper appreciation and understanding of Ruth. That she represents not only a woman who came out from Moab to the fields of Bethlehem, but one who shows somebody working in the ecclesia of God for Christ. Helping us to understand a little better those who come out 
to the gospel, hope, and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ in the ecclesia.